All right, well, good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's Southern Fire Exchange webinar. My name is David Godwin and I'm the director of the Southern Fire Exchange with the University of Florida. Today, I'm excited to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Kevin Robertson with Tall Timbers Research Station. Over the next hour, Dr. Robertson will discuss a summary of the state of the science regarding wildland fire history in the US. In this interesting presentation, he'll be highlighting areas of agreement and controversy related to the topic. I think it should certainly should be an engaging webinar and I'm pretty sure some folks will have opinions to share during the Q&A session following. So I'm glad you're here today. I'm looking forward to it. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Kevin Robertson received his BS in botany from Louisiana State University and PhD in plant biology at the University of Illinois. He's currently the Fire Ecology Program Director at Tall Timbers Research Station and Land Conservancy in Tallahassee, Florida. There he studies the plant community ecology of southeastern U.S. pine ecosystems, the natural history of the Gulf Coastal Plain, remote sensing of fire, effects of fire regimes on plant communities, soils and fire behavior, and prescribed fire effects on air quality. He also provides extension and education regarding the use of prescribed burning and fire dependent ecosystems in the southeastern US. As part of that effort, he's a co-PI and a key member of our Southern Fire Exchange leadership team. We're excited to have Kevin with us today and just one moment as, as we get his presentation loaded. Okay, thanks for the invitation, David. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, um, thanks for the opportunity to be here this morning um, or this afternoon. I think there's broad agreement in the fire science community, fire ecology community, that we need prescribed fire. We need more of it than we have today for the purposes of uh, promoting natural habitat for wildlife and biodiversity for mitigating the effects of, uh, of wildfire. Uh, however, when it comes to fire history, it can be a little bit of a different story. There's a good bit of controversy as to what's happened over the last few thousand years and beyond. And uh, very broadly speaking, we can divide uh, two ways of looking at things into different fire history paradigms. And they've traditionally been called the anthropogenic fire paradigm, which suggests that uh, most fire regimes were uh, from humans lighting fires, and most fires were human initiated. And the natural fire regime, and I put the word natural in parentheses, it's uh, more or less synonymous with uh, an understanding that the most important fire regimes, the dominant fire regimes in North America were where lightning uh, initiated and maintained. Of course, um, one, one could argue, and many do argue, that humans are natural as well. So that's, again, why I put it in parentheses there. But we call it natural fire for the purposes of, uh, of this presentation. So just an overview of the purpose of this talk is to provide a very brief overview of the anthropogenic and natural fire regime paradigms. You know, as well as we can, I, I'll apologize ahead of time for it being oversimplified and uh, really just kind of providing a caricature of these two different sides. And just for full disclosure, you know, I came back up through uh, primary an academic ecology background that looked at things more from the uh, natural fire history paradigm, but I've learned a lot along the way um, and we will do the best I can to present two sides of it. The Another goal is to present examples of, of comprehensive evidence-based research approaches that consider various sources of fire. And so kind of bridge the gap and aren't really coming from one camp or the other to give us an example. And to emphasize the importance of evidence-based fire history knowledge for conservation management. It does have important implications, I think, for the kinds of, of management decisions we make. And last of all, to speculate on possible sources of bias that we should be careful to try to avoid. So uh, again, apologies for oversimplification, but broadly speaking, uh, here are some, some differences in, in the two different ways of looking at things. The source of fire, of course, in the anthropogenic fire column here is humans, and natural fire is lightning primarily. The uh, regulators are, are culture, human tradition, etc. cetera. Uh, the natural fire regime is, believes that fire is climate driven for the most part. <clears throat> 
time scales, years or longer, or whatever, whatever time, whatever time um, interval humans might influence things. So uh, there could be very rapid, abrupt changes with changes in culture, changes in occupation by humans that would strongly influence uh, the fire regime. The natural fire regime, since it's based more on climate, uh, may may um, change more on the at the scale of of climate change, glaciations and the like. Spatial scales, uh, local or larger. Again, um, whatever spatial scale might match human activities, human culture. And again, under the natural fire regime, more regional uh, because again, they're climate driven. For species adaptations, the anthropogenic fire regime size more looks at various causes. In other words, uh, just because a plant is in a place that's frequently uh, burned or in, in that it survives well in that habitat, even thrives in that habitat, it doesn't mean that that's the conditions that it was adapted to. So it may have adapted to grazing or other sources that just happened to be well suited to fire. Whereas the natural fire regime, uh, fire paradigm side tends to, to say, well, you know, plants can just be fire adapted. And in fact, we think that most of these plants are specifically fire adapted. And as far as species associations in particular communities, particular locations, uh, the one side thinks of them as more more stochastic. In other words, there might be lots of different histories that lead up to particular species being in a particular place other than evolution in response to fire, uh, whereas the natural fire paradigm is tends to lean more towards believing that the plant species associations and native communities, as we find them today, were co-evolved. They've been together for a long time, evolving together, influencing each other, and not just um, a, a mix that's more stochastic or having to do with, with different different uh, fire histories for different plants. Again, very general. Um, anthropogenic fire, I'll, I'll kind of start by presenting things from this, this perspective uh, very broadly. One argument is just that human burning is extensive. Uh, whenever people came to, to the new continent, they found people burning and they found people burning a lot, especially along the coast uh, where they first arrived. And so you get quotes like this from, um, from uh, the 1700s reported by Bromley that, that uh, most places seem to be frequently burned by people. Uh, early maps like this one by Sargent in 1880 pretty much presumed that all fire that they came upon was, uh, was human initiated and they recorded very frequent fire regimes in, in many parts of the country that they attributed to uh, anthropogenic fire. <clears throat> The evidence from, from dendrochronology research certainly suggests that humans have changed fire regimes. So this is one of those typical skeleton plots you see in dendrochronology research where each line is a tree and each hash is a, a, a fire that's been recorded by a scar in the tree. And on the bottom here, dates of fires. And so early on, this is interpreted as being the, the period where Native Americans were primarily lighting fires. And this is in the Missouri River Lus Hills. Um, and then you get this very frequent fire suddenly with uh, Afro-European settlement, fur trade, range, purposeful burning almost annually by um, Europeans. And then the settlement period where things kind of settle down because it's more of a farming type land use. And then finally suppression where the fire just kind of stops. And, and this, uh, this sequence of, of, of events in terms of fire frequency is fairly wide ranging across the uh, eastern United States. You often see this this pattern in the southeast and in the central part of the country, the northeast. <clears throat> Lightning initiated fire is not sufficient, at least in some regions, to maintain a frequent fire regime or to maintain a fire regime that we think was historic. So uh, this map on the left that was put together by Rich Guyette and Mike Stambaugh and others um, shows a, a broad uh, correspondence to the amount of, of lightning strike density, which we see on this right hand uh, map. However, there are some disconnects such as in the Carolinas, for example, in Virginia, where historically there's um, evidence that there's very frequent fire, but maybe not so, uh, so dense of lightning strike density as there is like in Florida and in Oklahoma and South Louisiana. And over here in California and the the Northern Valley, very high fire frequencies when there's um, very low densities of lightning strikes here. Although, um, you know, we'll revisit that a little bit later as far as there being lightning strike fires in that area. 
Uh, anthropogenic fire is is by and large an, an older or more traditional way of looking at things, and so it, it, I'm not sure the cause and the effect between Clemencian succession models and people's thoughts about the source of fire, but they tended to um, tended to look at things from the traditional successional model perspective, where the climax was a, a non-fire oak hickory beech closed type canopy forest. And uh, early successional species were ones that um, that came up from disturbance and were maybe more rural, uh, did a better job of, of invading areas. And that this was maintained by, by fire and specifically human lit fire. So the overall perspective is more that kind of the, the, the natural trend of things is towards a, a climax that doesn't have fire, but because of the um, intervention of humans, there were ecosystems like southern pine savannas or oak savannas where uh, human fire was keeping things at this early successional stage. <clears throat> so um, for example, the famous Kukler map that was put together, you know, Kukler asked them, do you want me to map the way that things have been the last few hundred years or do you want to map the way they're kind of, uh, I don't know if I want to use the word supposed to be, but would naturally um, become as a product of succession and, and they told him the latter and so he map the southeast as a southern mixed forest, uh, just as an example, which um, would be that way if it weren't for the intervention of humans burning as often as they do. Uh, fire tolerant plant associations are a product of stochastic processes, kind of like I uh, touched on a little bit earlier, that the, the species in a particular location at a particular time that uh, are, are very fire tolerant, and I use this word fire tolerant as opposed to fire adapted, which might be more on kind of the anthropogenic side here too, which suggests that it doesn't mean necessarily they evolved uh, in response to frequent fire, but they do well in frequent fire communities, such that if you start burning in a certain area, if those plants are around, or if they're able to disperse that, that to that area, then they would um, begin to compose that community, but they not they haven't necessarily been together for, for millennia or millions of years or whatever. Um, you know, fire dependent associations are no older than the last glaciation, as, as recent as 10 to 13,000 years ago. It's thought that the southeastern United States, again, as an example, was a broadleaf forest. So, where's the longleaf pine savanna? It has to be younger than that. Um, so, maybe it came from a, a, a range of different sources as it kind of reconstituted itself or, or maybe came together for the first time since the last glaciation. So the, there's the possibility at least that the uh, species associations as we know them are relatively young, certainly not millions of years, um, at least that's possible. So the natural fire regime, so-called, we'll kind of go over that a little bit. And using the same map, lightning initiated fire is widespread, at least in some regions. So here's where uh, where you're from might have an influence on how easy it is for you to believe that lightning initiated fires could maintain the uh, historic fire regime. It's pretty easy to believe in Florida, especially South Florida. Uh, you know, over in, in California, it might be a little bit harder because there are um, a much lower cloud to ground lightning incidents. <clears throat> However, uh, Comeric, for example, in 1967, um, in talking about natural fire, showed that there are a lot of uh, lightning initiated fires in the West as well you can see that they're heavily distributed along these mountain ridges. They tend to be in high locations that are more likely to be struck by fire and be kind of arid. Now, how far these fires could spread into surrounding areas, of course, is uh, a subject of, of speculation. But there are a lot of uh, lightning strike fires in the West, and there still are, despite there not being a, a shower of lightning as there is in, in Florida, for example. <clears throat> Fire is climate driven, and this is a, a pretty central tenet of the natural fire paradigm. And here's an example in the southeastern coastal plain where these uh, black dots represent the length of the rain free interval. In other words, the higher the number, the drier it is. And that tends to be, um, the, the, the rain free interval tends to be pretty high around now, in fact, where we haven't had rain in a while. Uh, late May, I mean, late April to June, May into June. And that corresponds to the increase in thunderstorms coming in off the coast and where you have this overlap of dry weather and the lightning uh, or the thunderstorms coming in off the coast, you tend to have a lot of fire at that time. And that, that does tend to be the case still. 
uh, in the southeast and a lot of places. And just to make that point, um, these are just some data I got from the Florida Forest Service showing a uh, number of lightning fires and lightning fire acres during 2018. Um, and we can see it from May to June, there's a pretty big spike in the lightning fire acres and they um, taper off as you continue to have thunderstorms, but things are pretty wet and humid and, and less likely to have uh, a very large lightning initiated fires, wildfires. Uh, one of the appeals, I think, to the, the early proponents of the lightning fire or natural fire paradigm um, was that it fit well with the international literature on savannas. For example, in South Africa, you have uh, this uh, period where in, in the wet season when it was dry, where you have an increase in fires in fire size and fire intensity, and it's very strongly seasonal. Um, and so the idea that uh, that season is driving fire regimes in North America kind of kind of fits in well and, and fits in with the idea of southeastern pine savannas being a, a member of this international club of, of climate driven fire savannas throughout the world. <clears throat> uh, convergent fire adaptation suggests that uh, that fire is in fact an, an evolutionary force that uh, there are plants, at least some plants, that appear to not just be coincidentally um, fire tolerant. And so you get these kinds of characteristics like thick bark, a uh, tendency for plants to either bolt or, or keep their vegetation high enough off the ground to reduce their exposure to fire. And these kinds of um, vegetation structures that baffle the convective heat flow of, of fire and, and um, protect the apical, apical meristems, or at least that's the, the story that's easy to tell from looking at, um, at, at plants that have these similar sorts of structures. Of course, the uh, ability to, to re-sprout and to have apical meristems below the ground seem fire adapted, although they could also be um, adapted to grazing and other above ground disturbances. Uh, the kind of a piece of evidence is this occurrence of parallel and yet endemic community associations. And, this is, uh, I took this from a species list of um, plants in a Brazilian grassland and a longleaf pine savanna. And what this is, is on the left column, each of these are plants that have the same genus in both cases, but they have different species. And in fact, the species are endemic in both cases. And so this kind of parallelism in the phylogeny of different communities kind of suggest that uh, these are not just random um, associations, that these are different uh, plants with different life history characteristics, but are, are filling uh, complementary functional roles, which suggests that maybe they're co-evolved, but once they're isolated in different continents, they, um, they continue to evolve at a lower taxonomic level, but they're kind of uh, ancient sisters, you might say, coming from a, a fire regime that's that's possibly very old. And of course there's the famous wiregrass which uh, mostly and almost only flowers when burned in the, the time that lightning fires are most common from May to June. Uh, they flower a little bit if, if grazed or clipped but a, a very little bit relative to their response um, to fire. And the suggestion that they, um, they only flower at the time when lightning strike fires are most common has been interpreted as they're being uh, adapted to lightning initiated fires. <clears throat> and the, uh, the natural fire paradigm looks at succession a little bit differently. Um, there's an argument that the, the native community is actually itself a climax community that's maintained by frequent fires. So fire is sort of the, the status quo or the, or the ecosystem conditions that maintain it as a, as a stable community where soil disturbance, which occurs at small scales, can reset succession, but the dominant landscape is this fire-maintained climax. Of course, large-scale soil disturbance by humans can set uh, back large areas, such as in the case of old field succession, but that uh, only a small area of the, of the native landscape was in this early successional state. So um, this leads to looking at the community as, as, as more of a, a stable, uh, maybe ancient community association. Um, Herman Hopp Chapman picked up on this early in the 1930s and, and made an argument that the longleaf type really behaves more like a climax community. And Chapman was actually uh, a big proponent, proponent of the idea that lightning initiated fires were the most important um, source of fire historically in the Southeast. 
he was a uh, he was one of the founders of the Yale School of Forestry and a, a very important forester and, and ecologist in the early part of the century. Uh, this is all consistent with um, ideas proposed by uh, Veldman, for example, and, and others of, of thinking of these grasslands in the southeastern United States and in the Great Plains uh, and in other places throughout the world as, as being um, what they call old growth uh, grassland savannas and woodlands in the sense that they're, again, a more like a climax community and that they could be very ancient, maybe millions of years old and co-evolved and that they have life history characteristics. Uh, for example, um, a lot of storage in their roots so that they're adapted to re-sprouting following fire. Um, they tend to be perennial, uh, long-lived, and they tend not to disperse into disturbed areas like soil disturbed areas, areas where the plants are eliminated as in the original uh, model of succession. They tend to just kind of hunker down uh, in, in, in do really well with being burned frequently and grazed frequently, but uh, they're definitely not rural early successional type communities. There's also the idea that fire dependent plant associations can migrate without completely um, becoming disassociated. So just as an example, uh, here's um, some maps that were postulated for 13,000 years before present. The, the grasslands of the Great Plains were rather limited, but then expanded over time. Uh, and then the grasslands um, in the Yucatan may have, you know, just migrated further north, so on and so forth. Uh, Reed Noss talks about this a lot in his, um, his grasslands book about the Southeast, about how you could have community types that may not have been in the same place for millennia, but they've perhaps migrated and then migrated back um, over time. <clears throat> which allows them to, to co-evolve for periods longer than since the last glaciation. Uh, work done by Watts using pollen cores in, in, in uh, lake sediment environments have uh, pines here going back before the last glaciation around nine to 10,000 years, going back as far as 20,000 years in this study. Uh, in some other studies, he has them going back as far as 40 or maybe even 60,000 years, if I'm not mistaken. Of course, uh, around, the, and this is from Florida, I should mention, during the last glaciation, the area is dominated by spruce and oak, but before then, mostly pines. And then the, the graminoids here kind of disappear when it's cold, but they're still there before the last glaciation. Just uh, some evidence that uh, there are probably fire regimes prior to the last glaciation in the southeast. We don't know if this is longleaf pine and this is wiregrass for sure, but by and large, uh, throughout the world where there's pines, there's fire with few examples, with few uh, exceptions. And that's often the case with grasslands as well. <clears throat> also, the modern perspectives on fire might be obscured by altered landscapes. So uh, the idea, if um, a, a landscape is fire dependent, then it would probably pretty, be pretty important to believe that fires could spread a long way once they're initiated by fire, unless you're an area like in South Florida where you have so much fire that it's not even as important, but most parts of the country for a lightning initiated uh, fire regime to be the primary fire regime, but the only fire regime fires would have to spread a long way. And we kind of lose sight of this perhaps because of how much uh, fragmentation there is on the current landscape. So it's hard for us to empirically know how far fires do spread. Um, and there haven't really been a lot of efforts to model that yet. Uh, I was influenced early on in my career by the Ingram fire in the Everglades that spread 50,000 acres from one lightning initiation or, or, or a series of them. And then the Okefenokee fires that were lightning initiated and spread over hundreds of thousands of acres. Those were in wetlands, but um, you know, wetlands are the only place we have left that are those kinds of continuous landscapes to look at that, that sort of phenomenon. Whether that occurred in the uplands, uh, it, it's a little bit harder to see today because we don't have those kinds of, of um, unfragmented landscapes. And there's the, uh, the, the pristine pre-settlement myth that is, is tempting for the uh, natural fire uh, camp to, 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 to want to embrace that, yeah, there are humans, but you know, they were kind of living in harmony with nature and didn't have a, a real big effect on things. And it was really the natural processes and the climate-driven processes that kind of squelched any uh, important effects that they may have had. So uh, having given a very broad overview of those two different paradigms, I'd like to just present some examples of what I feel like are more comprehensive approaches that are 
really kind of taking seriously the the data, the evidence, and and not um, coming at the questions from from strongly preconceived notions, uh, just to kind of perhaps inspire and encourage us to to have a, a similar perspective when we do research or or think about the applications of research to conservation. So one example in my mind is work by Jennifer Marlin from Yale uh, School uh, Department of Geography, I think, and she's uh, a member of the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies as well, uh, who's done dendrochronology and uh, also charcoal uh, history research in the West and in other parts in the United States. In this particular study, she was looking at uh, places where there are fire scars and charcoal influxes in, um, in sediment cores. And her, her broad uh, kind of conclusion here is a pretty fancy looking graph, but these, uh, these upper two lines up here are basically the uh, amount of fire that she's interpreted from, from charcoal density going back from uh, 1400 years before present to, uh, to current time. And um, the, the uh, blue line here is the temperature uh, anomaly and uh, in which corresponds pretty close to drought indices. And this line at the bottom is uh, a rough approximation of the human population. So what we can see is that the, the fire regimes mirror pretty closely the climate we, all the way up to about six to, six to 500 years ago. And um, the overall trend of the amount of fire is actually uh, downward, despite the fact that you have uh, a presumed increase in population of humans. However, in the uh, post-Columbian period, things change pretty rapidly. We have a decrease in humans because of plague and everything. And uh, then the fire begins to, uh, to increase rapidly with an increase in the human populations. And uh, here's our climate-driven period that leads into this time where, uh, where humans are, seem to be causing an increase in fire, uh, despite there being a downturn in the uh, in the temperature. And then finally, during the um, fire suppression phase, you have an increase in humans and, uh, and a decrease of fire. So the point being that you've got this, uh, what, what she's interpreted as being a climate-driven fire regime that suddenly interrupted or, or superseded by the influence of humans once they became dominant enough to really take control of the fire regime and override it. <laughs> Another example is um, from Rosemarie Muzika and, and colleagues looking at the, uh, the Great Lakes area using dendrochronology evidence to, to con construct mean fire return intervals. And uh, their interpretation was that along the coast here where you have uh, pretty heavy human settlements, these fire return intervals were, were probably driven by human initiated fires. Uh, down along the lake edges that are more interior where humans may have visited or camped and started fires but were not very subject to lightning initiations. There were even longer fire return intervals. But the shortest fire return intervals were up on the, uh, the highest points up on the mountain ridges where you would expect the most lightning strikes to occur and they interpreted those as being lightning initiated uh, even though these areas are in fairly close proximity to each other. You can see the number of kilometers in between them. Uh, they used their anthro fire index, which I th uh, was uh, developed to give an indication from dendrochronology and other uh, evidence as to whether or not the lightning, wh whether or not the fire regimes were more likely to be driven by human activity or lightning activity. And it basically has to do with uh, if, if the fires correspond more to drier conditions and they're more likely to be climate driven and if they're occurring in exactly the opposite conditions when humans were more likely to light fires and it was more likely that humans were initiating the fires. But they showed here that for uh, a period of time up until 1750 or so, which is a date we often see in dendrochronology research as when um, settlers from mostly Europe came in and started burning very frequently, that there's probably more lightning influencing the fire regime and then afterwards more so humans. Uh, also, there's an overall trend of their being um, more fires or higher fire severity index under conditions where it was droughty and less so when it was moist, again suggesting a, a kind of overarching climate influence despite the uh, strong influence of, of humans on the fire regimes. A study that I had the pleasure of being a part of very recently, uh, led up by uh, Holly Noel out of Florida State, 
looked at the uh, the the Florida Forest Service um, fire records over time and showed this um, kind of interesting pattern where the uh, the, the more uh, prescribed burns you had, the uh, the less wildfire you had, and vice versa. These these two were statistically inversely related to each other. Um, so, which, you know, makes sense that people want to do prescribed burns when the conditions are, are more mild and less likely to do prescribed burns when, um, when they're more severe, we expect there to be wildfires. But the fact that the, the overall effect was that uh, more fires are, are being burned um, in, in the times where there aren't as many droughts. In other words, humans on the landscape have basically overridden the uh, climate driven fire regimes in the southeast because there's so much prescribed burning done at different times of the year. Um, however, if you look at the the wildfire uh, burned area in this red, you can still see there's that hump, you know, from May to June when you expect there to be more wildfires uh, initiated by lightning at the end of that dry period. And so this is an example of a superimposition of two fire regimes where they're, they're both occurring. You can pick up on both but uh, overall, the, the human effect is, is overriding the, uh, the climatic effect. Uh, of course, uh, that's not the case everywhere in the country. We can only wish that that were the case in many parts of the country, but that's the way it appears to be in Florida. Uh, a study done by Norm Berg for the special issue of the, of the Fire Ecology Conference we did with Yale University in 2013 studied this species uh, turkey beard, which pretty much only flowers after it's burned. And it can go a long time without flowering in between fires. And so he was arguing that this is a, an actual fire adaptation to reproduction. Uh, it's limited to the ridge tops where you would expect there to be uh, lightning fires more likely, and conversely not located in areas where that had probably more of an anthropogenic fire regime or areas where, where fires were less predictable. Um, Another study was done by Barden in 1974 that showed that at the same time there, there were man-caused fires mostly in March and April, but that there were also lightning fires occurring in, in the middle of the uh, Appalachians in Tennessee, uh, but that they were pretty much limited to the, the upper ridges of the mountains where you would also find Table Mountain Pine, Pitch Pine, Shortleaf Pine, Virginia Pine. Again, you know, where there's pines, there's fire that uh, probably he would argue were, were, um, were there because of a, of a long history of lightning initiated fire on those ridge tops, even though uh, other sources of fire are common in the area. And I just want to point out that these three studies that I mentioned are occurring in areas where at the national map, you don't have very high uh, historic fire frequencies at the regional or the county level, but within these um, sub-communities, especially these mountain ridges, you, they, they do argue that there are lightning initiated fires. The point being that uh, there could be a fairly fine spatial scale between what's primarily anthropogenic burning or primarily lightning fires. Um, and it depends on, on, on context and uh, context within the human habitation as well. Uh, work done by Day and Hammett didn't necessarily talk a lot about fire specifically, but they do talk about the influence of the spatial distribution of humans which reflect natural resources and the intensity of their effect on the landscape uh, corresponding to the popula population densities in pre-settlement times. And so one could presume that the same is true with fire where you had uh, higher, higher uh, densities of humans, there would also be a stronger influence of the humans on the fire regime. And conversely, possibly the farther you get away from these communities, uh, the more there would be uh, a natural or climate driven or lightning uh, initiated fire regime. <clears throat> uh, going back to this map and pointing out the fact that the lightning strike density is not as high in the Carolinas as it is in Florida, and yet if you look at the uh, coastal plain floristic province, which is historically dominated by longleaf pine and the uh, going all the way up into Virginia, there's that, that kind of um, mismatch perhaps, and I've talked to ecologists who I respect in the in the Carolinas who have told me they didn't think that there was enough lightning in those areas to maintain a one or two or three year fire return interval. There might be some debate about that, but their um, speculation was that these communities uh, are made up of plants that evolved and, and co-evolved in places where there were frequent lightning initiations, but then sp were spread by humans up the coast into areas where they were maintained by a human fire regime. 
So that's a, a plausible theory, one that's still um, discussed. Uh, some work that we're in the process of doing from, um, from an old field succession study here at Tall Timbers with Sim and Dixon and myself and uh, Allison Snyder looks at uh, the succession of plants since uh, the abandonment of row crop and comparing it to native cover. The thing I wanted to focus on in this study, I mean in this slide, is that uh, the native cover itself, uh, native plant community I should say, is made up of both plants that are endemic to the area, probably about a quarter of them, but also species that are native and both native and widespread throughout the continent. You can find them, some of them in the Northeast, uh, some of them in the Great Plains, some of them even in the Southwest. So uh, it could be that our native communities are not, or, while most of the plants are, have the life history characteristics of in, in old growth grassland and they appear to be perhaps co-evolved, fire evolved, um, there are also several species in there that may have uh, come in from more stochastic processes or, or, or may have evolved under different circumstances that just happen to overlap with these southeastern pine savannas that we're studying so that the, um, the overall community could be a, a complex blend of, of, of these different um, life histories and evolutionary histories. So just to kind of bring this to conclusion here, some synthetic concepts that I think we should try to take away are uh, one, the, the, the possibility of the supersedence or superimposition of fire regimes. So just because humans have been maintaining a frequent fire regime over the last hundreds of years, even last thousands of years, doesn't necessarily mean that there would not be a natural fire regime uh, in their absence. And I think some of the dendrochronology research suggests that, and, and the converse uh, could be true as well. Um, and we can kind of see this in some modern examples. There's variation of fire history and causes at, at both fine and regional spatial scales. So uh, there could be a different fire regime just right up the mountain or right down the river than, than the location where you're standing that uh, could have to do with either geomorphic influences on lightning strike uh, frequency or the influence on the distribution of human populations and how they're using that land whether they had a reason to burn it, whether they're there to burn it, et cetera. And so I would argue that uh, fire history needs to be, needs to be uh, studied very contextually in thinking about how both uh, natural sources and human sources could be interacting with each other and how they interact with the natural topography and climate. Um, fire evolved species or co-evolved associations could be spread by humans. So uh, just because uh, an association is where it is, doesn't mean it was always there. It could have evolved, species could have co-evolved in a different location and been spread into a new location by anthropogenic burning. Um, some people think that that's the case in the Prairie Peninsula in Illinois and in Iowa as well, where they feel like it's, it's too, uh, too wet or not enough, uh, not the right conditions for lightning. Uh, maintain fire regimes, but they're possibly spread eastward from the Great Plains uh, by human initiations. A uh, fire evolved species or co-evolved association, um, I think I meant to say migrates with climate change or, co or could, uh, could migrate with changes in climate. So just because um, the present species associations may not have been there because of the coming and going of the glaciations, doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't uh, together somewhere else, moving farther south or moving uh, just in response to changes in climate, but yet continuing to influence each other, uh, maybe co-evolve or have uh, complementary functions in their ecosystems. And uh, just in general, ecology and natural history, I would say are sciences of context by their very nature uh, and not really, um, best explored with broad paradigms or uh, absolute universal truths. And whenever we're studying fire history, uh, once again, we should always consider the context and consider uh, multiple different possible causes for the, the fire regimes that we find evidence for. Um, some of the conservation applications, um, evolutionary life history characteristics may need to be considered in applying fire. So where there does seem to be um, possibly evolution to adapt to fire and the fires needed at a certain time, a certain frequency to uh, allow that species to function, then that certainly should be, should be considered. Um, 
if if that's a conservation goal, uh, wiregrass and you know getting it to 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 flower and reproduce is an example. Um, another example is the brown-headed nuthatch. For that, it, it tends to create its cavities and dead trees close to the ground uh, in in the mid spring or late winter around March when if there was a, a natural fire regime of, of May to June primarily they would be good to go but they've uh, often kind of taken it on the chin by burns that are more um, convenient or more effective for us to light in February and March and a possible explanation is that uh, historically they they weren't threatened by such fires because they're later in the season. Um, historic or natural fire regimes may not be appropriate in human altered landscapes. I think that this is an important point that um, even though a particular lightning maintained fire regime may have functioned when you have all the native species present in the natural structure and the natural landscape, uh, if, if there, there are serious changes to those ecosystems, which there almost invariably are, then we have to consider those as well. One kind of example of this is um, the attempt at Tall Timbers uh, several decades ago to apply uh, quote unquote lightning season burns or burns in, in May and June in old field communities where, where there aren't the longleaf pine that produce uh, a lot more needles and you don't have wire grass and you don't have a as great of a dominance of grasses. And so um, it was really, it, the fire was not being effective. It wasn't uh, top killing the hardwood, hardwoods like it should. It wasn't spreading like we wanted it to. And so I had to accept that, well, this is kind of a different structure because of its uh, old field history. And so it's important to burn earlier in the year when it's dry enough, the relative humidity is low enough to get fires to spread to maintain uh, an ecosystem structure that's natural, you know, grassy, open, uh, and open canopy that that now better provides for red cockaded woodpeckers and Bachman sparrows and gopher tortoises and and all of those uh, species that depend on that kind of uh, natural structure that we've had to change the fire regime from what we think was a historic or natural fire regime to get it to function today. If you follow that, uh, conservation should prioritize ancient plant associations. If we agree that uh, there are such thing as ancient plant associations, they should be a high priority. Uh, again, um, the argument made by Veldman and others that uh, once these things are, are eliminated, they don't tend to come back very easily because again, they're not rural uh, plant species. They, they don't do a good job of returning once they are eliminated. And again, an example is in the Southeastern coastal plains with these wiregrass dominated landscapes where there's soil disturbance. It takes a long time for a lot of the species to come back even with a with a single disking, we're, we're finding out from uh, from research that we're doing in the southeast and from anecdotal observations that uh, these fire breaks in ring around stay in a state of altered vegetation uh, longer than people's lifetimes, because a lot of the native species just just don't come back very easily, and so we should give uh, priority to trying not to soil disturb um, native communities that that appear uh, to have species not very well adapted to dealing with soil disturbance, for example. Uh, the future of prescribed fire will be determined by culture more so than um, than our concepts uh, about what happened in the past. Um, for example, you know, human values such as quail hunting or, or, or other values that cause people to burn in their private land are going to be important for maintaining frequent fire regimes um, more so than um, than lightning uh, initiated fires at this point on the landscape in most places. And so uh, really dealing with or uh, really kind of thinking about what are the things that make humans choose to do what they do will be really important to consider in trying to keep native biodiversity and natural ecosystems going forward. So just kind of taking a wild guess here on my part, sources of potential bias. I'm not a, a social scientist, but I think one source of bias is just professional area of study. Uh, people coming from different backgrounds tend to to em emphasize different things. I've noticed that uh, historians and anthropologists tend to gravitate towards the anthropogenic fire regime, whereas plant ecologists and maybe climatologists tend to think of it uh, more from the natural fire paradigm. Um, but you know, it's good to kind of break out of our own ways of thinking and to consider the other sides. Regions of study, uh, if you are coming out of a place with a lot more lightning fire, then it's certainly easier to believe that there's a a lightning maintained fire regime 
um, appeal of global paradigms. I think this is a, a, a human tendency for a lot of us. We'd like to kind of oversimplify things, but science is, is, is rarely simple. I'd say that ecology is never simple and again needs to consider context. Uh, beliefs about evolutionary adaptiveness and uh, to what degree plants and animals are what they are because of a uh, response to particular evolutionary cues, uh, how rapidly they evolve, I think influences people's views of, of, uh, of the importance of fire in the past and uh, whether or not plants and animals are actually fire adapted. And you know, this is, uh, this is ripe for a lot of discussion and argument, but something that we should continue to discuss and argue about. And I think perception of damage done by the opposing view might be one of the strongest sources of bias where people see that the, uh, you know, people who are trying to burn in the, in the growing season under dry conditions when an area has been fire excluded for 30 years uh, killed all the longleaf, you know, or, or uh, people perceiving, um, uh, you know, winter burns is, is having uh, allowed areas to become unnaturally shrubby or whatever. Everybody's got their story about how uh, somebody who, who looks at things differently than they do uh, used fire in a way that um, kind, of, kind of set us off, off course. Uh, again, you know, I think it's really important to, to consider context and consider management goals and kind of come together on what's effectively achieving those goals, uh, whether it be more of what we think was a historically the fire regime or what we think is just uh, a practical fire regime for achieving the kind of habitat and biodiversity that we want to try to conserve going on into the future. So uh, I'll stop there and see if uh, if David has any questions uh, from the crowd and uh, let him take it from there. Thanks so much. All right, well, thanks so much, Kevin. Uh, once again, if you joined us during the presentation today, my name is David Godwin and I'm the director of the Southern Fire Exchange. And that presentation was on fire history from Dr. Kevin Robertson, the director of the fire ecology program at Tall Timbers Research Station. So we do have time remaining in our hour today. Uh, if you have comments, you have questions, uh, please uh, speak up and share them. Uh, you can either type them in the chat window or even better if you put them in the, the Q and A uh, tool in Zoom and we will go through and, and uh, and field those as they as they come in. So it looks like we've got some starting to come in. Let's see here. But Kevin, if you want to uh, keep your presentation up uh, to refer to any of your slides, uh, you can. Now here's one that comes in uh, from Zach. And, uh, and he says, do you think the fire maintained the Southern Appalachian balds? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I think that that's, that's possible that, you know, that's, probably something I don't know enough about to speak about. I know that there's an argument that it could be just uh, purely edaphic as well. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't know enough about them. I'm not an Appalachian ecologist, so I hesitate to respond. <laughs> <laughs> we had a question that came in uh, from Sean about the if this will be uh, recorded. And yes, Sean, uh, this presentation was recorded and we will have it on the Southern Fire Exchange YouTube channel uh, in a couple weeks. Here's one that came in. Uh, what time of year did the native uh, Indians burn in Florida? I think they varied. Um, there's knowledge from the Appalachian uh, Indians that they, they burned uh, late fall uh, to prepare areas for crops as kind of agricultural burning. Um, and uh, I think in the winter for hunting purposes, kind of clearing out the, the, uh, the woods to have better visit visibility for hunting. Um, but I think there's a, a good bit of variation, but it tended to be in the cooler time of the year is my understanding. Here's one that comes in from Joe uh, and he says, what kind of critical fire history data are lacking in the Southeast or Eastern US that could still be obtained through fire scars, charcoal or other means? So what are the, what are the key gaps that, that come to mind? Well, I, I feel like we're just sticking our toe in the water of dendrochronology in the Southeast, which is one of the reasons that we've gotten into it uh, here at Tall Timbers. I know that uh, Mike Stambaugh and his group are, are increasing their efforts in the Southeast as well. The uh, dendrochronology research is always a little bit limited in that there's only certain places where you have the material that is recorded scars or you've got old stumps and they tend to be kind of far apart. But uh, the more we can kind of drop more 
dots on the map, so to speak, in the southeast and see what uh, different fire regimes were occurring at different times is, is definitely going to help us fill in our understanding of the um, spatial variation and you know heterogeneity in fire regimes in the southeast if in fact they were spatially heterogene you know heterogeneous I, I think they probably will be I mean for example some of Gene Huffman's work was in the barrier islands that where it appeared that um, the dominant fire regimes were, were lightning initiated looking at the times that uh, that they were occurring um, but further inland, it, it, it might be different. It'd be interesting to see, you know, there's the, the study by Mike Stanball in Louisiana that showed um, kind of a mix of, of, uh, of growing season and, and dormant season burns, as far as I understand. And we're doing work on that right now. But uh, we certainly need more work to kind of fill in that picture and get a better understanding of what's been going on over the last four or 500 years. Are, are there certain regions uh, in the east or the southeast that stand out that you see gaps in? in the fire history data? Well, it's a lot easier to say where we have any knowledge of the fire history data. Yeah. You know, there's some on the coast again that uh, Gene Huffman did. There's been work on the Lake Wales Ridge area, the work by uh, Stamball et al. over in uh, Louisiana. has uh, been a little bit in southern Mississippi. Um, what am I missing? Not much. <laughs> and, and, you know, that, that's uh, the, the work that we're working on right now is is on the the coast of Florida, not too far from from uh, Huffman's earlier work. Uh, there might be one or two other places, but that's that's about it for the coastal plain. So here's a, a follow up question that came in from Sandra, and she's asking about uh, the Native American burning in Florida. Uh, do you think, or is there evidence to, is that, was that the same time of year that they were burning in other parts of the country or, or out West? Or do you know if, was that, were they burning uh, in times of the year? Yeah, I'm not a, an expert, you know, on the Native Americans, but like I mentioned before, my knowledge is that the, uh, the Native Americans in, in the Panhandle region at least tended to burn in the late fall mm -hmm. and in the winter. So the cool times of the, of, of the year, um, again, for, for planting purposes for agriculture and then, you know, hunting the deer populations when they're active and having good visibility during the winter. I don't think they had uh, a lot of a reason to burn closer to, you know, what we consider to be the, 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 the lightning season. Here's a, another question that came in and says, can you speak on the, the season, the prescribed fire seasonality, natural or anthropogenic in areas such as Tennessee, Virginia, or North Carolina? Uh, in areas that weren't dominated by longleaf or no of references to support. Okay, so the <laughs> the question getting into you know season of burn um, in areas of Tennessee, Virginia, North Carolina, perhaps Piedmont is maybe what he's thinking, or or even up the slope that weren't dominated by longleaf. Um, well, in the Piedmont, I think there's a lot of uh, evidence that at least in recent centuries it's been dominated by anthropogenic fire and again those tended to be in the in the cooler parts of the year mm -hmm. uh, not not the late spring or early summer for some of the, you know some of the same reasons mentioned before and so that's another... why you know dendrochronology claims to be able to at least make some kind of you know, course interpretations as to based on the location of the tree scar within the uh, tree rings as to what was more likely to be lightning strike fires versus the anthropogenic fires. You know, there's a pretty, pretty broad generalization that the ones that are occurring in the dormant season are, are probably mostly human initiated. And the ones that are occurring in the growing season are, are, are probably mostly um, lightning initiated fires. And so, um, you know, again, I'm not the expert on that, but I think that that, that assumption is, is based on a certain amount of historic and cultural evidence that most of the, uh, most of the Native American burning was, was done in the, in, in the fall and in the winter. There's an interesting question that came in from Matthew and he's, he says, how would you characterize how the understanding of the importance of lightning season fire in the coastal plain has changed since the 1980s and 1990s? Um, yeah, I guess it depends on what you mean. If it's like more from the scientific community or from the the management community, mm -hmm. I think that uh, my my perception, at least from like the management or how we use fire, was that in the in the 80s there was kind of a a big um, I don't know kind of a push to 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 change everything to the quote unquote natural fire regime to to burn in the 
in the May and June, you know, the, the so-called lightning season fire period to kind of keep everything natural. But then over time, I think that um, we came to realize some of the things that I talked about that that wasn't necessarily the best time to burn for landscapes that were long fire excluded or landscapes that were old field and had different vegetation types or landscapes like in the Everglades, for example, where the hydrology was severely altered by humans and that that had to be taken into consideration. Another big problem with trying to limit things to the uh, lightning season fire was that you were just limiting how much burning you could do. And that was the biggest concern from land managers that um, if you did it at that time and if for whatever reason there's a drought and you had to put off the fire, then then the fire return intervals would get even longer and longer. So I think from since the 80s and 90s, when there was a big push to go to uh, lightning season fires, there's been more of an uh, equilibration, I guess, to, to just say, well, let's let's burn whatever we get to burn, you know, so we can kind of maximize our fire frequencies, which are ultimately the more important, the most important thing for accomplishing that that ecosystem structure, you know, ultimately getting that that open kind of grassy, forby, shrubby pine savannas with the open canopy in the southeastern context is is the most important goal you know in other words the fire effects and focusing on that and i think we've gotten closer to that which is which is good and admirable you know burning when it makes sense to to achieve those um, ecosystem structure goals and to get fire on the ground frequent enough um, to accomplish those goals there's an interesting question that came in from gage uh and he asked do you think a man's impact on climate will alter the ecological timing of lightning season burning or when we choose to burn so um, and maybe back that up a little bit. Do you have you seen evidence to s suggest that that we've even impacted um, when and where we're seeing lightning occur? Uh, I don't know anything about how, our influence on lightning itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, we influence the uh, the lightning initiated fire regime by just um, superseding it with prescribed burning. You know. <laughs> like I talked about before. So if you burn an area, then you have a lightning strike, it's obviously not gonna burn because you've already burned it. So we've definitely influenced the regime, but I don't have any knowledge about how we've actually influenced uh, the climate other than you know what a climatologist would tell you about climate change so far. And here's one that came in from Martin and says in, in areas that lack ancient lakes for sediment core pollen analysis, are there technologies to assess early land cover and uplands such as studying phytoliths in soil samples? Yeah, I think there are. And you know, the, the research that Jennifer Marlin did was an example of using, uh, uh, you know, charcoal, for, for example. Uh, that's again, you know, outside of my, outside of my field. I'm not really a, a you know, physical um, fire historian, but, but the, the phytolith concept is one that, that shows a lot of promise. It hasn't, you know, it's still kind of new, but it's it's exciting to think about the different technologies, what they can teach us about fire history. Here's one that came in the chat window from Tim, and uh, it says that one of the maps showed a high frequency of fire in eastern and central Texas, uh, where that coincided with low lightning frequency. Uh, and he says, well, when and what effects are associated with that area? So um, could you speak to that area? What what effects like uh i'm i'm guessing that he's he's just referring to that um the difference yeah. there between observed high fire frequency and low lightning frequency there i don't want to speak for um you know guy at all who who put together that map but i'm mm -hmm. assuming that they're thinking that the um you know the eastern part of texas the pine savannas that are there and then the uh, kind of the more um, chaparral type habitat extending over to San Antonio was was primarily a uh, a, a human maintained fire regime going um, into the eastern part of the state there before it you know gets too dry to really have enough fuel to carry much fire. Mm -hmm. And here's a question that came in from uh, Rachel and. Uh, Rachel says, do you think that there's an association in less frequent lightning areas to a higher likelihood of fuels maintaining an ignition? Um, personal anecdotal experience from Idaho seemed to suggest that lightning hitting in the sagebrush was probably going to give a start. Uh, I think the, you know, to what degree communities become more flammable or less flammable with time since fire just depends on the community. I mean, just within Florida, the uh, the wetland communities that that make up the the um, 
flatwoods, for example, tend to become a bigger and bigger fire hazard with time since fire because they're evergreen broadleaf plants that have a, a lot of uh, flammable oils in them and everything. So the tai uh, tai and gallberry and in, in the rest of those uh, become increasingly flammable. But in the uplands on ultrasol soils, uh, which make up uh, the upper part of the coastal plain and the Piedmont, for example, you get uh, what, what's been dubbed uh, mesification or the, um, the dominance of, of trees and other plants that were historically in more uh, wet, uh, less fire frequented areas. And those, those trees tend to be, um, tend to be in, unflammable. And so they actually decrease the chances of, of fire in the future. Or if there is a wildfire, they tend to cause them to be less severe. Um, you know, obviously out west and places like the Pon historically Ponderosa Pine communities, those turn into bombs over time, as we've as we've seen tragically in the west. But it's kind of real, um, you know, community specific, location specific. So we're. Uh... We're over the top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and do one one last question that came into the the Q and A window here, and we'll wrap things up. And uh, I think this is an interesting point. Uh, anonymous attendee asked, uh, "Can could you speak on the interactions of grazing ungulates and fire ecosystems? Do ungulates increase or decrease fires?" And I, I think that does mm -hmm. raise an interesting question. And I I know I've seen um, Reed Nos talking about the the role of um, bison and other things uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the southeastern U.S. Could you talk about that? Yeah, that's a, a really a real interesting topic and a big one. And we don't study it enough in the southeast because we've tended to take uh, ungulates out of the areas that we uh, have in conservation. I, I was real influenced in my thinking about it by visiting the uh, the Tallgrass Prairie TNC Preserve in in Kansas, where they have bison uh, and and fire that uh, really demonstrate the um, school of thought that came out of Oklahoma State with uh, Ron Masters and his colleagues of, of the patch burning dynamics where you have a fire that occurs in some limited area and the, uh, and the bison and the grazers, they go to that location and they, they chew all the green stuff that's coming up, you know, resprouting after the fires and they keep eating that and eating that until uh, the other areas where they're not grazing become rank and full of fuel and then those burn and then they all go to that location and start grazing and I've seen that you know at the tall grass prairie and so um, you, know, we, you know we know from the the cowboys in the in the southeast needing to burn the uh, the range every winter to green up the grass so that the cows can survive that that fire is an important force in in providing that green vegetation that uh, ungulates and other browsers can get to that's true of deer too. They all go to where you've most recently burned because they've got that green fresh vegetation. And so while they're eating that vegetation, other areas are not experiencing grazing and they're becoming uh, heavier in their fuels and, and ripe for burning. So uh, my point is just that I, I think that thinking of ungulates as being this kind of like grand lawnmower that, uh, that, that cuts down all, um, all uh, fuels at the same level at the same time is, is greatly oversimplified and that there's this kind of teeter-totter of, of fire leading the way and creating uh, the right environment for ungulates to, to have that food available to them. Uh, they might be able to, I, I don't know, you know, maybe some of these, these animals could survive in areas where they don't have fire, but they certainly wouldn't like it very much. <laughs> you know, the bison would avoid the areas that hadn't been burned recently, like the plagues. They don't want to have their tender little noses poked by rank grasses. But, um, you know, certainly a topic that I think we should research more in the Southeast because, uh, the, the large ungulates that have been with us in the past across the across the southeast are, are, are largely uh, missing now, except for places, a few places where range is still uh, continuing. You know, there's a guy in southern Mississippi who, who grazes his cattle on native longleaf pine, and he said that if he, in the areas where he doesn't have the cows, he burns every year. In the areas where he does, he burns every three years. So it's some anecdotal evidence that they reduce the fuel load. But I, I suspect that uh, there's a pattern where they're they're doing it in a complex way that's patchy, that doesn't um, that doesn't supersede fire. All right. Well, thank you, and I, I think that's a, certainly an interesting um, question and and point to end on and have us to all continue to look forward to new research that'll help to open that up. Uh, it looks like we've run up to the end of our time today. Uh, I'd like to say. They say thank you, Kevin, uh, for your presentation. 
and uh, certainly interesting. And I know everybody enjoyed it and you had some great questions that came in afterwards. Uh, we had a great uh, crowd on the line today. Uh, if you uh, would like to apply for SAF CFE credit for participating, uh, please visit the link on your screen. Uh, you can't click on it, you have to type it in. Maybe you can take a screenshot. Or uh, I posted a copy to the link uh, in the webinar chat uh, to open up a short survey to provide your information for CFE credit if you're looking for that today. Uh, and if you have any trouble with that, you can just shoot me an email, dgodwin, d.godwin at southernfireexchange.org, uh, and we can get that uh, figured out. And finally, as we do close out the webinar, uh, we do ask that everybody to please just take a couple of minutes to fill out a five question or so web uh, survey. Uh, to let us know your thoughts about the webinar. And we share those results with uh, Dr. Robertson and uh, how uh, you thought of the presentation and how everything worked out. And uh, also if you have ideas for future webinar topics. And we do use those uh, to come up with our plans for the future to make sure that uh, we're helping to meet your fire science needs. Today's webinar was recorded and it will be archived for later viewing on the Southern Fire Exchange YouTube channel. Uh, so if you had colleagues that couldn't make it today, uh, check that out in a couple weeks and we'll have it up there. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Thanks, Kevin. Um, this has certainly been an interesting topic. I will take uh, a point here to, to quote Stephen Pine from a book here in my office. And he says, speaking about fire history and fire culture, he says, fire history, like fire itself, is a maddening amalgamation of human and ecological history. It belongs with the humanities as much as it does with the sciences. So, so thanks so much, Kevin. Uh, certainly enjoyed your presentation today and have a good afternoon, everybody.